Um, my name is Aidan Finn and I work for a company called Micro Warehouse where I'm a technical sales lead. Um, most of you will never have heard of Micro Warehouse and that's kind of the way it's supposed to be. Um, we're a distributor so we provide open licensing to value-added resellers who then sell it on to end consumers in the typically in the sub 250 user space. Um, I'm an MVP with a virtual machine expertise which basically means I'm a Hyper-V person. Um, my background, server stuff, desktop deployment, that sort of thing. Tweet is at Joe underscore Elway, blog on Aidenfin.com and recently published this with a few other people and a few other MVPs and a Microsoft consultant in Switzerland. Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V installation and configuration guide, bit of a mouth search engine optimization. Um, and you can buy that in all good bookstores and a few bad ones too. So, with that done, and um, this is what I'm going to talk about. Hopefully Dave has left me a few things to actually talk about this morning, um, because we have an hour and three quarters to fill, and I thought I'd add an hour. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm known for talking way too long um, when I get started about this stuff. Um, so we're going to start with the very small and work our way up to some very cool solutions that Microsoft have released in Windows Server 2012. As Dave mentioned earlier, Microsoft looked at their own needs and there. They talked to customers for a year and tried to figure out their pain points. A lot of the feedback they got back from customers, large and small, was that storage was expensive and difficult and inflexible. This is a common thing they were hearing from the small business all the way through to the large enterprise. Think about the small business that wants to put in maybe a Hyper-V cluster or a SQL cluster or something like that. The most Microsoft looked at that and listened to that feedback. <coughs> then they started looking at the inflexibility of hardware to find network virtualization, where we've started to well, again. I wouldn't be surprised if it is an official term. Talking about more of that a little later on. So the first thing I want to talk about is virtual hard disks. We have a new format of virtual hard disk in Windows uh, called VHDX. Windows 8 and Windows Server. In the past we had VHD. And the VHD format file is actually quite old. You may have come across it for the first time in Windows Vista, Windows, uh, well actually Windows uh, 2008 Hyper-V, maybe if you worked with Virtual Server you came across VHD, or Virtual PC you came across VHD. Microsoft inherited it when they bought a company called Connectix, which is where they started off in their virtualization world. In the VHD I believe actually the format goes back to the 1990s. And its big limitation was that it scaled out to 2,040 gigs, just under two terabytes. So if I needed bigger storage, looking at daisy chaining these VHDs, or is that providing raw LUNs, or pass-through disks as we call it in Hyper-V, raw device mapping in the vSphere world, we had to provide those to virtual machines. And that was a limitation, because we don't want to go towards hardware, we want to go towards software. Software and files are flexible, easy to move, easy to back up, easy to replicate. Now, VHDX has a lot of benefits. Native 4K sector support. This is a big deal. In the past, disks have been using 512-byte sectors. That means they read and write 512 bytes at a time. The storage industry has had to move beyond that. 
disks are getting bigger and they've had to move towards 4K sectors. Now our operating systems, our virtualization platforms, our applications haven't supported these 4K sectors in the past. Microsoft are the first to actually support 4K sectors. It, but without this native 4K support, what the disk has had to do is lie about the size of the sectors that it's reading and writing. So it did something called read, modify, write. When an operating system, an application, a file system asked for a chunk of data, they'd ask for a specific address and say, I want this 512 bytes. The disk would spin, read in 4K, and then chop up that 4K to find the 512 bytes and hand that back up to the file system. Little bit of latency, not so much, just a little bit. Where the real problem was is the RMW process when we needed to write back a new 512 bytes. The file system would come down and say, I want to write this 512 byte chunk to the disk at this address. The disk would now have to spin around and read in 4K. Then inject the 512 bytes into the right part of that 4K, spin the disk around again to get to that point, and write it back down. And that could increase latency for writes between 20 and several thousand percent. And believe it or not, you're probably doing that right now on your tablet, your phone, your USB sticks, your virtualization servers right now. In fact, I would almost guarantee it. I was amazed when I checked on my Windows 8 tablet that it is actually doing this with its storage right now. So VHDX gives us 4K sector support. So we can match that. And with Windows 7 SP1 or Windows Server 2008 or 2 SP1 and later, we can actually create native 4K VHDX files, which we can put on native 4K disks without this RMW process. So we get native write speed all the way through. So we don't have all that latency that can be introduced by RMW. And Windows Server 2012 <coughs> and Hyper-V are the only products doing that right now. Um, alternative virtualization products are still stuck with RMW. Um, the, I should have these uh, ordered slightly differently, but the big headline thing about VHDX is the 64 terabytes, 32 times bigger than the legacy uh, VHD and 32 times bigger than the competition. So that means my virtual machines can have big whopping virtual hard disk files. I can put a lot of data into them. Um, that 64 terabytes, by the way, is also the maximum size of, v of a VSS snapshot. So if you're doing application consistent backups, that's the biggest size of a, a vol an NTFS volume or a Refus volume that you can back up. A bit, one of the concerns people have had about having these whopping big virtual hard disks is data corruption. What happens if that file becomes corrupted? Well, the VHDX file actually has built-in protection to help us during that point when data corruption could possibly happen which is during a power outage. So it will deal with all those problems automatically. We'll talk about check disk a little later on. And with Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012, VHDX is now the default format. You can still create VHD. We can convert back and forth. We'll have a look at that later. Um, but it is the default format when you go to create new storage. OK, demo. Word of warning, I am flying by the seat of my pants with these demos today. Um, so if anything goes wrong, it's the real world. And these are live demos, none of uh, Dave's videos. <laughs> I might do that for Hyper-V Replica tomorrow, though. Um, you don't want to see stuff uh, copying across the network back and forth. So um, here I am on a Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V host. And make sure I'm opening the right stuff. And there we go. And I have some VHD files here. So if I actually view and show my file name extensions, you can see I've got a VHD file and a VHDX file. Um, not many people know this, but VHD and VHDX are actually used outside of Hyper-V. And you can, for example, boot a computer from a VHD or a VHDX file. How many people have ever done that? A handful. If 
Do you ever want to trial a new operating system from Microsoft without you know, blasting away a machine? You can download the 180-day trial of Windows Server 2012, for example. I'm sure you'll find a link on Dave's blog. Maybe get a USB key, I don't know. Um, but you can download the VHD or VHDX file and drop it onto your Windows 7 or Windows 8 computer and configure um, the bootloader, so BCD Edit, to actually offer this VHD file as a new boot option. So you can boot up with that. Some people in the data center are actually deploying VHD files instead of installing their server operating systems onto the disk. So they format the disk, drop a VHD file onto it, and boot from that. I was doing that in my, in fact, I still am in a way, I'm doing that in my demo lab. So my Hyper-V hosts, every time I want a new Hyper-V host, I literally just drop a new VHD file onto there. And it replaces the previous VHD file. So none of this next, 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 enter product key, yada, yada, yada. I've just got a VHD file that I drop on. VHD files, you can typically mount them, whatever's going on in here. Um, but you can mount them. You can definitely do it in Disk Manager. Um, and you can actually inject stuff into them. So you could have a VHD file sitting in a library, mount it, inject drivers into it, inject Windows updates into it, and then deploy it afterwards, and it's already up to date. Um, if I go to disk management, I'm not gonna do that, thank you very much. In disk management, I can action, create VHD, or attach VHD. So let's see if my attach will work here. It probably won't because those VHDs are literally just zombies. Um, so VHD, yeah, they're zombies. Um, I, I've got them locked by doing some other stuff as well. Um, but we can typically attach them, browse them, treat them like cab files or zip files. So they've become the data center container for Microsoft. You can do this using PowerShell as well. we'll uh, actually, we will have a look at that in a while. Um, and of course, if you are running Hyper-V, which you can run on Server 2012, obviously you can download the free Hyper-V Server 2012, and you can run Hyper-V on Windows 8 Pro or Enterprise. Um, and it's the same Hyper-V that you'll find on the server, it just have, doesn't have some of the server functionality like live migration or clusters. So in here, I can go new hard disk. And you can see by default, it's picking VHDX instead of VHD. Next, by default, it's gonna pick dynamically expanding. Now, if you've ever heard me talking about VHDs in the past, you'll know that I dread dynamically expanding VHDs in the real world. I prefer fixed size. This is almost a religious debate within the Hyper-V MVP community, dynamic versus fixed. There's a 50-50 split with us. There's some folks who love dynamically expanding VHDX files and VHD files because they only consume a tiny bit more space than the data that's inside of them. So if I create one of these right now and I say I want it to be the default size of 127 gigs, it will actually only take up a few megs on the disk. And as I put data into it, it will grow. Now there's a, it grows by a nice large block size, so there's not latency caused by the growth when you're writing data to the dynamic VHD. But because it's expanding the dynamic VHD in little bits at a time, if I've got lots of these dynamic VHDs on a single volume, I can introduce fragmentation. And that will impact my read performance. And you typically see that on SQL servers and database servers. I've seen when I've converted from dynamic to fixed queries dropping or getting faster by 20, 25%. I know there's other people in this room who've seen similar things as well in the real world. Fixed, my preferred option in the real world when I'm deploying production systems. When I deploy a fixed size virtual hard, if I say it's 127 gig, it will create a file instantly that is 127 gig. Who here has a problem with deploying fixed virtual hard disks. There's gonna be some of you, you're all being really shy. Um, it's not the video cameras, is it, guys? Um, <laughs> so one of the complaints I hear about fixed virtual hard disks is it takes ages to create one. A dynamic one, when I want it, it just appears. 
but a fixed one takes ages and ages and ages. Reason is, Hyper-V zeroes out, well actually it's not Hyper-V, it's the file system, zeroes out the contents of the fixed virtual hard disk as it's been created. And this is to make sure that anyone who installs an operating system and boots up that operating system in the virtual hard disk can't actually scan whatever was in the file system underneath beforehand. So it's a security measure to give you security in your cloud and in your data center. We'll come back to that whole it takes ages thing later because they've got that salt seriously solved and um, taking advantage of some hardware. And then we've got the differencing type. The differencing disk is where we take some golden image and store it in a shared place. And every time I want to deploy a virtual machine, I create one with a differencing disk that points to that parent. And the child only stores the differences. This is fantastic in a lab where I only need to keep the VMs for a short amount of time. It is fantastic in VDI. In fact, the pooled VDI that Dave showed you uses differencing disk. When you log out of the virtual machine, it gets rid of the differencing disk and puts in a new one. So every time someone logs into that pooled VDI virtual machine, they get a flattened, clean environment. So their changes are non-persistent. Only their personal data, which is in their personal virtual hard disk, is kept. That's great. Not for your production servers. I come across people on forums saying, I want to use these because it allows me to quit the virtual machine. Yeah, but they'll run like a dog within a couple of days. And some really bad things will happen. That is for short-term, short-lived virtual machines. So I'm going to go with dynamically expanding just because it's quick for now. Next, um, give it a name, demo live browse, and I'm going to store it in D, VMs, select folder, next. And now my options. What size do I want? 27 gig, and you'll see it can go 64 terabytes. So that's pretty big volume. Anyone using disks bigger than 64 terabytes at the moment? Okay. If you're all being shy. Um, this is one people don't realize is there. Copy the contents of a physical disk. Create a virtual hard disk from a physical disk that this machine can actually see at the moment. So if you've been deploying physical disks to your VMs, here's a way of actually converting them into virtual disks. And then finally, copy the contents of another virtual hard disk into my new VHDX. Here's a potentially a way to convert a VHD into VHDX. But there's other ways to do that as well. So I'm going to say, yep, thanks very much. Next, finish. And that's it. I've got myself a virtual hard disk file. No, it's data volumes. But it's a good question, though. Um, for that, you'd want realistically you'd be looking at a V2V tool or something like uh, a P2V even. And people people very often don't realize that you can actually use P2V tools on virtual machines as well. Uh, sometimes V2V tools aren't necessarily the right option. And in terms of V2V, we've got bazillions of those now. We can remind me tomorrow, and I can talk about those. Um, so that's. That stuff. Um, so the sector size sign of things. How do I figure out what my sector sizes are? Yada, yada, yada. Well, uh, let's see if I can remember this. This tool, in case you do not know, is ISE. ISE is Integrated Scripting Editor. It's built into Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012. This is a great tool for learning PowerShell. I did not know PowerShell before uh, March of last year. Typically, it's only Exchange people who knew PowerShell. Um, and I've been using this a lot. You're going to see me doing PowerShell like you wouldn't believe tomorrow uh, when I'm doing the Hyper-V stuff. You'll see me building a cluster in a little while. Tomorrow you will not see me building a cluster, but I will get a cluster doing, I think, two mouse clicks um, and all configured and all that good stuff. But what I'm going to do here is get, and you can see it's doing this IntelliSense thing. So as I type get, it's saying, well, here's all the possible options. I'm going to say get disk, and I want 
to feature a number and star sector star. And what it's actually done for me here is it's showing me each of my disks by their number and their sector sizes. Now let's highlight this one here, the second one, disk number six. It's got a physical sector size of 4096, that's 4K. But it's got a logical sector size of 512. That means my disk supports 4K sectors and it is presenting 512 sector sizes to my file system and my operating system. It is doing ORMW. You can also run a tool called FSUtil and it'll give you this sort of information as well. Um, it's a command line tool. You run this on USB sticks, your tablets, whatever. There's a good chance it's going to come up with those same numbers as well. For quite some time, our storage has actually been pretending that it's up older and slower. And as a result, it's actually having to be a lot slower when we uh, write to it. So I can also run new VHD and minus... Uh, path uh, d colon backslash vms um, and I'm going to call it minus nay actually I'm going to call it um, demo live 2.vhdx minus logical sector size bytes 4096 minus physical sector size bytes 4096 and I've got a typo in there um, do, 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 do. can I convert demo live 2 to oh yeah silly me and let's say one two seven zero zero zero. Yeah, nine six plus size bytes uh, ten gig. <coughs> As you can see, I am literally doing this live and figuring out the PowerShell while I'm doing it. So this is see here. You can see how easy this stuff is actually to figure out as you go along. And the more you do it, the more you remember it. So what it's actually done here now is it has created a VHDX file with a physical sector size of 4K to match the physical disk. But it's created a logical sector size of 4K, which now means if I install Windows 7 Service Pack 1 or Windows 2008 or 2 Service Pack 1 or later into this VHDX file, they will not do the RMW thing. They will perform at the potential write speed of the physical disk underneath it. It will do the RMW thing by. Is it going with a default size there, and that says what you did and what you need to specify it, or um, you know, what, what did it not like about the first? Uh, I didn't put in a size. Sorry, did you, did you that? Yeah, um, it wants to know how big the virtual hard disk should be. Okay. Stupid of my part. Yeah. So you can convert uh, an, an existing uh, yeah. to uh, 4K. Are you, are you oh, you, you can, yeah, by doing that suck in the contents in option. So you have to create a new one to suck it in. Yeah. To Correct. And there's also another thing to watch out for here. If you are running 2012 Hyper-V and you want to do backwards compatibility with 2008 or 2 hosts, you have to deploy VHD because 2008 or 2 doesn't have a clue what VHDX is. Um, you can create um, VHD files, and the block alignment of the VHD files have been optimized to work as good as possible on 4K sectors. However, if you move that VHD over to 2008 or 2 server and use it there, so basically you've moved it and it's stored there, and then you bring it back again, it's no longer optimized. So best practice, best advice to be for performance is if you are going to deploy something on 2012, keep it on 2012. Don't move it to legacy hosts. If you want to bring it back from a legacy host, 
to a 2012 host, you would have to do that, suck in the contents, create a new VHD file, please. If you create it in the VHDX, then automatically you will have the logical and digital. No. Uh, It'll do the RMW thing. By default. Yeah. And what's the tenancy on hardware? Is there an independent chain of hardware? Does the hardware have to default as well? Check. Yeah, you. so if you've got 512 um, bytes, I'm always getting my bytes and Ks mixed up, 512 byte sector size and physical layer, you can't obviously support 4K se uh, physical sector size in a VHDX. You would have to match what's on your physical storage. So if you run that guest disk or get disk commandlet to query what you've got in your physical storage, odds are right now you are running 4K physical sectors. Um, we're supposed to have that information on the stickers on the disks. I have never found that information on the sticker on the disk. Um, so if you run get disk or if you tilt command, um, you'll be able to get that information um, and figure out what your physical storage actually is. So this is about squeezing the very best out of it. No. Yeah. I would suspect down the road it will get changed by default, um, but no. So any more questions on VHDX? I was amazed I got questions. Usually this is just uh, yawn. <laughs> but it is actually a significant thing um, because it is Microsoft's data center storage mechanism. In fact, if you're running Virtual Machine Manager 2012 Service Pack 1 and you're deploying Hyper-V to bare metal machines, it will actually configure those machines using uh, boot to VHD. It actually deploys a VHD from your library to the bare metal machines over your DRAC or your ILO card or whatever it is that your boot management controller is. So you do get very rapid host deployment with that. So obviously, VHDX is great for Hyper-V, um, but it is used by other tools. Windows Server Backup. So if you are that small business that has one or two servers, Windows Server Backup is a possible backup solution for you. In fact, Windows Server Backup can even be extended to backup into Azure, like Dave mentioned. Um, useful for the people who are running uh, Windows Server 2012 Essentials. But now it can backup larger volumes. File. 2012, it's backing up to a VHDX file, which means we can now start backing up 64 terabyte volumes. Uh, native VHD, I've talked about, even storage spaces uses this technology to some extent.